I had a DM offer to run a one-shot against Vecna, with a party of five level 20 players with three magic items each. We spent a good week discussing our builds and strategy. On game day, the DM ports us into Roll20 with an awesome map and everything. Then on initiative, Vecna goes first, starting 120 feet away, and casts Wish. I wish you are all dead. The DM then kicks everyone from his Discord. I was initially so confused before realizing this guy was planning to troll us from the beginning. I mean, maybe it's a good thing you guys got kicked, because if that's how he's planning on running his fights, that's probably not a game worth sticking around for. My name is Jacob Crow, and welcome to the Crow's Perch. From atop my perch, I swoop down onto the trash heaps of TTRPG games gone terribly wrong, and pick out the cringy, the terrifying, and the unintentionally hilarious. Our first story is about a player in a joke campaign that ends up taking it way too far. So, without further ado, let's roll up our characters for our skeleton-only campaign as we gather up a murder and dive right into this story. Recently, I reconnected with my ex, who we'll call Chloe, whom we would constantly play Werewolf the Apocalypse and Vampire the Masquerade together until we had a mutual breakup a while ago. After going our separate ways and kind of drifting apart, I get a text from her, asking if I wanted to join her D&D group, as she needed another player. I join, and there's four other players. You have three regular people, playing human, variant human, and a changeling. But one of them kind of took the spotlight and shown it on themselves the entire time. Session Zero. The player, Viagra of Stiffwood was just being completely extra. The entire time, he cut off others while they were creating slash explaining their characters, trying to inject how his character would have done such and such when explaining backstories, or how he'd always have a comment or critique being piped up every few seconds. He would make comments such as, Your guys' characters are pretty generic. Just wait until you hear about mine. Or, Playing a human is kind of blind. You should probably change your race. Etc. Etc. One other player and I had to tell him multiple times to shut up, as he was very obviously kind of being a dick. He was second to last to describe his character, asking the DM a bunch of ridiculous questions and asking if she could homebrew a race for him, as he wanted to play a half-elf, half-tiefling, and nitpick all the buffs from both races. Attempting to get the 4-hour rest, Infernal Resistance, and both sub-race bonuses, which I can't exactly remember. He asked if he could have a double-bladed scimitar to start off with, and when declined, for somewhat obvious reasons, he told Chloe, I'll just do-wield two scimitars and take the do-wielding fighting style and flavor to be double-bladed. She agreed, however obviously annoyed. He spent a solid 15 minutes talking about his character, literally reading a script he wrote down on either Google Docs or Discord, and constantly asked the DM about locations he would have come from, been, etc, etc. He then showed us his character, which he made in Skyrim, and to his credit, was definitely well made and took serious time and effort. When it came time to present my character, I introduced Sir Loin, a furbog paladin on a quest to bring down the beef industry and liberate his brethren. Viagra spoke up, cutting me off as I start explaining why he joined the party, simply to go on a small tangent, asking if I was stupid and why I'd want to play a character like that, and to take the game seriously. Because the DM worked hard to provide this experience, so take it f***ing seriously. Chloe muted herself and later told me she was laughing her tail feathers off, because I already knew that this campaign wasn't going to be too serious, as the name of the campaign was a literal dick joke that seemed to go over his head. The Chronicle of the Sorcerer's Crystal Phallus. I wonder if the last boss is against the bad dragon. Everyone else was joking around for the rest of the session zero, except for Viagra, who kinda just stayed quiet only speaking up to mention his character every so often, and getting little to no response. A few days later, I get a DM from him, a decently sized wall of text, giving off complaints about literally everything, ranging from my character, 
to even me as a person. He pretty much told me that he didn't want to play with someone like me. And neither did the rest of the party. So it would just be best for me to leave, so they can enjoy the campaign. And how it would be better if I never joined in the first place. I pretty much give him about a paragraph about how it's not his choice in the matter. And how he kind of has a stick in his tail feathers for taking it too seriously. And that my character was absolutely perfect, with zero flaws whatsoever. About an hour later, Chloe asks me to hop onto a call. And she starts doing that thing where she's giggling and telling me to hear this shit out. He basically sent her the exact same thing he sent me, but changed some words around so it made sense. Asking her to essentially either talk to me or shadow ban me. She basically tells him to be mindful of himself, and that they're not going to have this discussion and how he needs to get along with me. She also told me to be careful and stay on my toes, as I was somewhat provoking him. The biggest kicker was him offering to cash up her $20 just to get rid of me. Session 1 rolls around, and once more, cuts everyone else off, tries to go first in everything, and constantly asks, would I be able to see, slash hear, slash make my way over while X is doing Y? Just so they could get more time as the main character. Their character, a female warlock, constantly cut off characters mid-sentence, and humble bragged about their powers. Normally, this is no problem, but this was after literally everything someone said. Oh, you're a changeling. I can just cast Disguise Self on myself. Honestly, your swordsmanship probably isn't that good. You probably couldn't even use a double-bladed scimitar like me. Etc, etc. Viagra had also dumped strength and con. I thought that's the opposite of what Viagra does. Anyway, raising all other stats, which will be kind of important later. As when stopped at a bandit slash warlord checkpoint slash shakedown, the guys pretty much just said pay the fee of five gold each and we could be on our way no problem. Viagra, escalating the situation, claims that he could destroy the entire checkpoint, using both magic and their double-bladed scimitar. The weird thing about it was that they were hell-bent on using the actual double-bladed scimitar stat block, which doesn't work well with Hexblade's curse, due to the two-handed properties, and never took the dual-wielding fighting style either. After the DM asked him to roll an intimidation check and failing, the party was now on the verge of combat. The changeling essentially tells them they don't want to fight, and how he'd pay for him. Yet Viagra basically goes, No, I'm not going to let you walk all over me. And suddenly, goes for an attack. I'll be honest, I was surprised since he managed to kill the first guy in one round. And they asked to roll another intimidation check. After being denied, and everyone rolling initiative, the rest of the party chose not to get involved. Opting to back up, since our variant human rogue with alert went first and just said we weren't getting involved. Viagra was pissed that we refused to help and got to attack another guy since the bandits rolled decently low, missing the first attack and not being able to add the damage modifier to the second attack. The bandit survived and two guys attacked him. He cast the shield spell, but one bandit crits after flanking him and another hits after rolling a 21. When Chloe says he's been killed from the total damage, there was an audible slam noise on his end and a quick mute. He stayed muted for the rest of the game. After that, the bandits loot his corpse and say that we can be on our way. And we make it to the next town over, ending the session there. Seconds after it ends, Viagra leaves the call and writes a rant in the general chat about how he was targeted. And you guys didn't step in to help me when I needed it. He claimed we were an awful group and bad to play with. And he flat out left the server. Me and Chloe stalked his Reddit account for a few days after to see if he posted anything about the situation and read a comment that he posted on an LFG post that just about went, Yeah, I'd love to join. I'm a really good RPer and put a lot of thoughts into my characters. And really fun to be around. <laughs> my last group kicked me out because they were kind of jealous of my character. Because I actually put time and effort into it. TLDR. I join my ex's campaign, make a goofy character that wants to stop the consumption of beef, serious and hard-ass player makes everything about him, 
and demands I make a new character. DMs the DM, and offers 20 bucks in exchange for kicking me from the party. Dying in the first session after threatening non-hostile bandits, blames it on us, and leaves. Expectations are incredibly important when setting up a session zero. Clearly the rest of the players had a very different mood in mind when they were making their characters for the campaign, as well as the DM. If you want to make a serious character in a silly campaign, honestly, it's okay to go against the grain. I'd encourage it even. Sometimes you need someone to play it straight and be a helpless observer to the wacky and insane antics of your peers. In fact, it might make things even funnier. I tend to play serious characters, or characters that I want to take seriously. And this is basically what I do whenever I'm in a chaotic group. Viagra did none of this. And when time came for him to stand up firm and stiff against the bandits, he fell soft and flaccid. Just remember next time you want to solo them, wear nothing but a jar on your head and two katanas instead of a double scimitar. At the very least, you could argue for a plus 10 on that intimidation roll. I think we're done here. So, let's move on to the next story. In this next story by user Project V, we find out what happens when a game that has been going on for seven years takes a dramatic turn for the worst. So, without further ado, let's finally put a pin on your 10-year-old campaign as we gather up a murder and dive right into this story. English is not my main language, so apologies in advance for any grammar issues. I've been a DM for a group of friends for a while now. Every day I always plan a little bit on my mind about the campaign and the future of the game, thinking of cool ways to make their characters feel and be awesome. After all, what's the point of playing D&D if you and your players are not having a blast? We're playing a custom-made campaign where they face off against a powerful demon entity from the Outer Plains, where the demon divided himself in different pieces that are bonded to other creatures. A way of preserving itself while also using these creatures to collect souls and gain power in order to come to the world as an almighty beast. The party is comprised of three paladins. Two of them are player characters, and another is basically a DMPC that's only there for healing. At the start of the campaign, there was no focused healer, we didn't have a cleric, and the other paladin was more focused on control than healing. So I asked them what they wanted, and they said, another paladin. So I rolled with it. There was also a rogue, a fighter, a cleric, and a mage that the group decided to adopt. Along the way, at some point, they are tasked with retrieving one of those fragments from a serial killer. It's a mixture of doing detective work while also having to face an enemy that can pull them to a pocket dimension where he is the law, if they trigger his traps. He uses roses as a way to force people into his world. Most of the time, they avoid the encounters with their plus nine to saving throws, but from time to time, one of them fails and is sent into a fight-or-flight scenario in a twisted art gallery of the murderer's victims. They arrive at the house of a noble that asks them for help, and one of the good paladins, a devotion paladin from Palor, decide that it is a good idea to claim that he could be the person behind the murders in a less than polite and very direct way on his house. The noble asks the group to depart and to leave him alone with the paladin. They have a small chat, and in the end, the paladin pushes the noble too far starting a fight where he's dealing with the noble and two guards at level four. He goes down, but the noble tosses him back with the group and asks them all to leave. The player at the end of the session, after making a choice that heavily impacted the group, just says, it's what my character would do. I like to bring a little bit of chaos to the table from time to time. He does this every single time. The other players don't complain because we're friends and we're quick to forgive him for that but it's getting to a point where it becomes annoying and detrimental to the group, and it kills all the interesting little things I had prepared for him, and the group as a whole. Then there's the other one, the Conquest Paladin who decides to roleplay him as a villain that only cares about strength, and is prone to being an asshole to all other NPCs. Usually I wouldn't mind any of these things. The problems began when the PC playing the Paladin of Conquest decided to be a rules lawyer in my campaign and questioned every single move I made. He was also constantly complaining of how he didn't want to have NPCs on the team, and how he only wanted to interact with other players and did not want to interact with the rest of the world. The request was not the problem itself. The issue was that the flow of combat was constantly interrupted, just so the Conquest Paladin could tell me things that I could and couldn't do. 
halting the game, just to point out that a creature shouldn't be able to do that. I asked him multiple times in private to just accept that some things are the way that they are, and that if he had any questions or critique, he can leave it until the end of the game. He never followed my request. I asked the other three players, and one of them agreed on getting rid of the DMPC. So, three against two. Democracy wins? I decide to get rid of the DMPC by killing it after they intentionally mock and push the BBG, expecting to somehow be once again immune to consequences. Especially since the BBG is a serial killer, and its main thing is that he could set up traps and then strike to secure the kill. After killing the Paladin DMPC, the same three players that were complaining started to say that I did it wrong, and then choose to bring back the dead DMPC. You can't just kill the character while we're making fun of the BBG? You're railroading us, said the Paladin of Devotion. So there I was, with a player that constantly roleplays a character that brings conflict and makes things difficult for the group, and another player that is being an unbearable rules lawyer constantly complaining that I railroad them by giving them consequences for their actions. It reaches to a point to where I feel physically ill after playing with them. I trust in my DM skills, and these two players are the only problem players. But from session to session, it starts to get on my nerves. After a lot of questionable choices, dumb jokes, fun interactions, and cool PC moments, they arrive at the final boss, the serial killer. This was a fun and difficult fight, but one of the players, the rogue, which is the best player of the group when it comes to behavior and role-playing, was killed near the climax of the battle, where the group was rescued by the person that commissioned them to complete the mission. After the NPC who commissioned them saved the group, and offered to even revive their fallen comrade, the Paladin of Devotion decided that he wanted to claim that the reason the Paladin DMPC and the rogue were dead was on her. The NPC, being a powerful rogue that can be pretty violent when things didn't go her way, decides to first try to be polite about it, explaining to them their agreement, and then reminding them that she saved their lives. The Paladin of Devotion refused to negotiate, and refused to give the woman the piece of the demon that was recovered after the serial killer was dead. So I stopped the game, and asked the group, Are you sure you want to do this? Yes, replied the Paladin of Devotion. Are you... Sure? This is a high-level boss with a lot of immunities, and it's trying to avoid conflict. Yes. I don't care. Let's go! The rest of the team is going to participate? I guess, said the Paladin of Conquest. If she attacks my friend, I'll defend him, said the cleric. Okay. The battle goes about as badly as I expected, and in only two turns, three of the four party members were down. The Paladin of Conquest is the last one up and remains loyal to his team. And this actually makes the rogue stop. She can empathize with that, and decides to give them another chance, using a special magical tattoo that she has to heal the downed party. The paladin gets back up after the rogue gives them a second chance, even going as far as to let them keep the piece of the demon, but with the warning of not using it. Then, as I get ready to finally show them the goodies for their hard work, the only thing that is needed for them is to allow her to use the piece for a moment. My idea was to give them a pocket dimension as a resting place, where each of them will have a room dedicated to their stories, their backgrounds, and some hidden hints to future stuff related to their characters. I dedicated nine hours to prepare for this, and then the Paladin of Devotion decides to be chaotic again. At this point, I basically ask him, please, just don't. You're going to like the reward, and I want to make it special for all of you. I dedicated a lot of time to prepare it. He then replies, I don't care. <laughs> this was the breaking point. I told them in the most anticlimactic way possible their reward. Then I refused to go into details or even roleplay anymore. I don't feel like being a DM. So I decide to leave, and at this point, I'm just tired of being the DM of this group of friends. So I just told them that they should find a new DM. It should have ended there, but they decided that wasn't enough. So the Paladin of Devotion texted me, asking, Why can't I do what I want with no consequences? That's why I play D&D. You railroad me too much, and don't allow me to play. And then, 
The Paladin of Conquest decided to go the extra mile and send me a text message with, Is this game for us or for you to tell a story? The thing that hits the hardest is that these people are my friends. And it's only during D&D that they become assholes. I have been dedicating myself to create a whole story about them. The serial killer was connected to the story of the rogue, and I introduced a lot of elements from other PC stories. But the constant critiques and complaints after every session, because they wanted this, because they believed that this was better for the group, because they didn't like this, because they didn't want that, because the rules as written rules doesn't say that, the creatures can do this, or what a role can mean that, all things that I tried to fix. But it was never enough for the Paladin of Conquest, or the Paladin of Devotion. I kicked them out of the campaign. Cleric decided to leave, and with only two players that were left, that weren't all that keen on playing without them, all those days of preparation, planning, and creation of fun adventures just vanished into thin air. Maybe it's because I was an old friend, that they thought that they could do whatever they pleased without consequences, that they could be rules lawyers, and that they could make choices for the group, because it was the best for them all. But I'm done with those two players. And I guess I'll have to find a new group of people to play D&D. So first, we talked about expectations in terms of mood and the feel of a campaign. In this story, this is about expectations of mechanics. Wait, don't click away yet. I'm not going to talk about math. I'm talking about mechanics that are much more interactable. Let's start here. Every good RPG has decisions to make. And the best kind of RPGs make you feel like the game is interacting with those decisions. But in order to make those decisions interesting, there has to be consequences. In my opinion, if you present a situation where there is a perfect decision that leads to no consequences, then you made a game with boring choices, which seems to be the kind of game that the Paladin duo here wanted, and a game that the DM definitely didn't want to run. But they just didn't care. So that's it for today's stories, and these were my thoughts. And I want to hear your thoughts about today's stories in the comments down below. And if you like today's stories, be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel to keep up with the latest RPG horror stories. As we transition into... Art of the Week. Art of the Week! This piece by user Dragon Trash, which depicts the crow in a beautiful cartoon art style, which I am more than certain has some kind of name. But I am also a Philistine that has no idea what he's talking about. Anyway, just look at the emotion of these expressions, the detail, an astounding piece worthy of being our Art of the Week. And in addition to our showcase this week, I am announcing May's art event. Surely you've seen a Wojak, but have you seen a Crowjack? The challenge is simple. I'm asking artists to crowify your favorite Wojak for a chance to be featured in the Art Hall of Fame on the Crow's Perch Discord. If you want to enter the challenge, Simply submit your art on the Art Submissions channel on the Crow's Perch Discord, with the winner to be announced in a video by the end of the month. And before we end today's video, I would first like to thank our patrons, like our burbs, Novatonix, Shepdog, and Reuven Gritters. I'll tell you what, kid, there are more burbs than these out here. Like the Counts of Quills, like Critical Kunik, Evix, King Drazil, Christian Pip, Cosmosis, Kooky Spooks, Rikus, Vincent, Haley Thompson, Zero Fang, and Netscape Navigator. We call them Baron. Bum, 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 bum. Barons of Beaks. Bum, 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 bum. Something, something that they don't eat leeks. Yeah, that rhymes. Like Kunto Sweezel, Moet is Mao, Chunky Salsa, Tech Blog, Currister, Carter Spawn, A Modest Pastry, Jester King, Gentle, Misfit, Gibber Woods. Wormy, Matthew Moquini, Den of the Drake, Mickey Yeatley, and Bum 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 Manya. And last but not least, the Dukes of Feathers, like Blues Otters, Jared Zemlin, Staniel Das Boot, Henna, General Constantine Chase, Happy Rex, Doc Salty 96, and Acroth. Thank you to my patrons for supporting the channel. And if you would like to become a patron yourself, why not donate to the Crow's Perch Patreon for as little as a dollar a month? It helps keep this boat afloat. And who knows? If I get enough patrons, maybe I can start uploading two times a week. And so, with all of that out of the way, I will see you next time as the crow flies. <laughs>